Okay, so let's do a little review for the test. Um, so on the test, there's going to be several problems that just say, like the instructions are basically the following, find the limit or state that it does not exist. Um, so let's do some like that. So here I have a limit, x is going to 3 from the left of this function. This is an elementary function, it's just a polynomial over another polynomial. The first thing you should do if you're doing the limit of an elementary function is to just try to plug in the value of x and see if you get a valid answer, and if you do, then that's it. Um, <clears throat> so, plugging x equals 3, uh, not negative 3, by the way. Like x is going to positive 3 from the left, so x is going to 3. Um, gives me, well, unfortunately, I, it's very easy for me to see. I'm getting 0 on the bottom, so this is not going to give me a valid answer. However, let's see what I get on the top, because that can still give me useful information. Um, if I put in 3 to the top, I get 9 minus 3 minus 5, which would be 1. So here's what just happened. We didn't get a valid answer, so we're going to have to do something else. But this is useful information. I got 0 on the bottom, and I did not get 0 on the top. So in a situation like this, uh, the, the, the answer is going to be one of three things. The answer is either going to be infinity, negative infinity, or the limit does not exist. Any time you get zero on the bottom and you get not zero on the top, it's going to be one of these three answers. Um, <clears throat> which one of these three answers it is? all depends on whether this is, roughly speaking, a positive zero or a negative zero. So, so what I just said is, is, strictly speaking, it's nonsense. Zero, zero isn't positive or negative, but we're talking about a limit. And, and what we have to imagine is that x isn't exactly 3, x is just close to 3. And this bottom isn't exactly 0, it's just close to 0. And then it makes sense to talk about whether this number that's very close to 0 that's on the bottom is it positive or is it negative? Uh, and, and that's a valid question, because it can be very close to zero and positive, or it can be very close to zero and negative. Um, and, and if we're able to tell that, then that will tell us which one of these answers it is. So let's get into the details of this particular problem. As x goes to three from the left, we have to imagine that x is very close to 3, but it's smaller than 3. X, so then x minus 3 would be a negative number for values of x that are smaller than 3. And also, it's, of course, it's close to 0 because x is close to 3. But, but the point is that this is a number that's close to 0 and negative. Um, meanwhile, the top is just going to, to positive 1. We, we already determined that. So what do you get if you take a number that's very close to positive 1 and you divide it by a number that's close to 0 but negative? Um, you get negative infinity, right? If, if, if this was like a positive 1 and I was dividing it by a number that's close to 0 and positive, then I would get positive infinity. So this is, this is enough information to just say the answer is negative infinity. Um, yeah, and so, so yeah, I just feel the need to make another comment here. By the way, this is just extra information. If I had done the same limit as x goes to 3 from the right, 
I would have said all the same stuff. I'd say, okay, the top is going to one, the bottom is going to zero. But now since x is going to three from the right, I would imagine that x is a little bit bigger than three and that this bottom would be like a positive number that's close to zero. In this case, I would say the answer is positive infinity. One more comment. If I had done the same limit again, but the only difference is I'm not specifying the right or the left here. It's just the x is going to 3. I'm not saying for the right or from the left. If it was that, I would say this one does not exist. And that's simply because if I don't specify a side that x is going to 3 from, uh, I can't tell you whether the bottom is positive or negative. Another way of thinking about this is in order for this limit to exist, the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit would have to exist and they would have to be the same. But when I did the left limit, I got negative infinity. When I did the right limit, I got positive infinity. So this limit would not exist. So like I was saying, these are the three possible answers. Whenever you're getting a non-zero number over zero, uh, that means that the answer is either going to be infinity, negative infinity, or does not exist. And here we see examples of each one. Okay, moving on. Um, let's do this one. What do we do first? Since this is an elementary function, I'm going to just try plugging in x. Unfortunately, I can already see that I'm going to get zero on the bottom. But like I said last time, let's see what we get on the top because that can still be useful information. Uh, th this isn't going to, we're not going to be done just by figuring out whatever's on the top, but it will help us. When I put in one to the top, I get one plus four minus five, which is zero. So this is different from the last one. Remember on the last one I was talking about if you get zero on the bottom and you don't get zero on the top, then you know it's one of these three answers and we discussed how to figure it out. What just happened on this one is we got zero on the bottom and we also got zero on the top. So what does that mean? This means that, well, it means you have to do some algebra. Um, this algebra can take a few forms. Um, sometimes you factor and cancel. Sometimes if you have square roots, you do this conjugate trick. We'll see an example of that. Um, sometimes it's just uh, sort of simplifying steps. In fact, I guess, I guess you could describe it all as just simplifying steps. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at this and think how can I simplify it? These are polynomials. One thing that stands out, and, and we've seen a few examples like this, is if we can factor the top and factor the bottom and then cancel something, then that would count as simplifying. And that's often a good idea. Now, let me show you something. X is going to one, and I know that it's giving me zero over zero. I'm going to go ahead and make this guess that the top has a factor of x minus 1 and the bottom has a factor of x minus 1 because that's a good guess to make because that would give me 0 on the top and 0 on the bottom if, if x is going to 1. So, right. Also, you just have to have your factoring skills, of course. This one is x minus 1 times x plus 5, right? Because 5 minus 1 is 4, and minus 1 times 5 is negative 5. Um, so that works. So that's sort of confirmation that I made a good guess initially, guessing that this, that this would have an x minus 1 factor. Looking at the bottom, I recognize a difference of two squares, so that would be x minus one, x plus one, and that's more confirmation that I made a good guess when I put x minus one there. Um, anyway, these cancel. 
So we just did some algebra. We did some cancellation, and and this is this is basically. Um, we should feel really good about what just happened. Um, what just canceled was exactly the thing that was making the top zero and making the bottom zero. It, it was exactly this factor of x minus one that becomes zero when I plug in x equals one. So I'm very optimistic about what's gonna happen now when I try plugging in x equals one again. Now I'm optimistic that I won't get zero on the top and the bottom. And if I put in x equals one now, it looks like I get six over two. So I'm happy. All right. How about this one? First things first, this is an elementary function. Um, so you just try plugging in x equals four. I always like to look at the bottom first because if that's zero, then, well, if it's not zero, then I really like it. Uh, unfortunately, this one's zero. Um, so what happens on the top? Well, I get two minus the square root of four, which is also zero. So it happened again. Uh, so what does this mean if I get zero on both the bottom and the top? That means I have to do some algebra. And looking at the type of thing that I'm dealing with here, I see square roots that um, kind of what jumps out at me is the possibility of using the conjugate trick. I see 2 minus the square root of x. The, the conjugate would be 2 plus the square root of x. So I'm going to rewrite what I had and multiply the top and the bottom by 2 plus the square root of x. What happens when I do this, when I have this minus this times this plus this, this turns into the difference of two squares. It's like 2 squared minus, it's like this number squared minus this number squared. And on the bottom, I am not going to multiply out the bottom. I, I could foil this out. I could do x squared times 2 and x squared times square root of x and 16 times 2 and 16 times square root of x, and I could do all that out. That would just kind of make a mess, and it would be counterproductive, actually, uh, because um, what I'm going for... Ultimately, I would like to cancel something from the top and the bottom, and therefore it's smarter if I keep the bottom factored, if possible. In other words, I would not want to multiply it out. Um, in fact, I want to factor it even more, because I see I can factor this. So let me try not to get ahead of myself. The top is just 4 minus x. The bottom, I see x plus 4, x minus 4, whoops, 2 plus the square root of x, like this. Okay, so here we are, and I said I want to cancel something. I kind of almost see something that I can cancel. On the top, I see a 4 minus x, and on the bottom, I see an x minus 4. Those are not the same thing, but they're, you know, they're, like, I see subtraction, and the two numbers are just switched. I, instead of 4 minus x, I see x minus 4. When you notice this, um, let me, there's an easy thing you can do, but let me show you. The top, this is the same as if I pull a negative sign out, then it's like x minus 4. 
th these are the same thing. If I distributed the negative sign, I would, I would have a negative x just like this, and I would have a positive 4 just like this. So this top and this top are the same thing. And then I cancel this with this, and all that's left on the top is a negative 1. Th this negative sign is left over, and since I canceled everything else, it, it's just a 1. Um, a shortcut that can give you the same thing is if you just notice that you have this and this, it's like A minus B and B minus A, just cross them both off and leave a negative one there. And, and that's ultimately that's exactly what happened. I'm just telling you a shortcut of how you can get there. Okay, where does that leave us? <clears throat> We were trying to evaluate a limit. We got 0 over 0. We said that means we need to do some algebra. Um, we should try to cancel something, and that just happened. So after canceling something, and especially I should emphasize, look at what we canceled. It's x minus 4, and x is going to 4. In other words, we canceled something that was making the top and the bottom 0. Right When x goes to 4, this thing is 0, but we just canceled it. And so now we should be optimistic that if I try plugging in x equals 4 again, that I won't have a problem. So if I try plugging in x equals 4 again, I have a negative 1 on the top. I've got an 8 times uh, 2 plus square root of 4, so 2 plus 2 and whatever this is, 8 times 4 is 32. Good. Okay, let's do more. <clears throat> There's ones like this where x is going to infinity or negative infinity. So x is not going to a specific, like a real number. And so if it's one like this, then I can't say what I usually say at the beginning, which is that you should just plug in the value of x, because you can't really formally plug in infinity because it's not really a number. We kind of intuitively can think about plugging in infinity, but I don't I want to avoid using the using that language that I'm plugging in infinity as if it's an actual number. Um so I'm not going to do the first step that I normally do when x is approaching a real number, which is to try to plug it in. Um, what am I going to do? Well, so I've told you that there's a rule, and this rule works whenever x is going to infinity or negative infinity, and whenever you have a polynomial over another polynomial. And, and that's what we have here. The shortcut for doing these is the following. You can ignore everything but the leading term on the top. The leading term is the one with the highest power of x. So the highest power of x I see is x cubed, so I'm just going to keep that part and lose the rest. And then I'm going to do the same on the bottom. And then, of course, x cubed just cancels. And so I just have the number 5 fourths. And so the, the limit as x goes to infinity of just this plain number, 5 fourths, that limit is, well, it's 5 fourths. That's the shortcut to do these. Um, when x is going to infinity, it also works if x is going to negative infinity, and it's important that you're doing a polynomial divided by another polynomial. And then if you have that, then you're justified in ignoring everything but the leading term. And, and doing that should give you the answer. Uh, all right, let's do one more like this, I think. Yeah, after this I have something different. Um, 
So yeah, it's just this one. X is going to pi over 2, and we're doing e to the sine of x. So it is an elementary function. You know, x, e to the whatever is, is elementary, and trig functions are elementary, and I'm allowed to combine elementary functions to make new elementary functions. So, um, so the first thing I should do is to just try to plug in the value of x, because x, x is not going to infinity or negative infinity this time. It is going to a real number. Well, it would give me e to the sine of pi over 2. So what's the sine of pi over 2? You should be able to figure this out without a calculator. Pi over 2 is 90 degrees. It's pointing straight up. The... Um, X coordinate at this point would be zero, the Y coordinate would be one, and sine is the Y coordinate. So sine of pi over two is one. So I get E to the one, which is just E, and that's it. I plugged in the value of X. I did not encounter any sort of problem. Uh, let me just point back to the first couple of examples that we did where plugging in the value of x did give us a problem. Like in, in part A, we were dividing by 0. In part B, we were dividing by 0. Also in part C, we, we found ourselves dividing by 0. But on the last one, we just plugged in the value of x and we got a, got a valid answer. So that's it. Um, some limits are that easy. You, I'm not going to give you a lot of limits like this, but th this is the reason why we try this first. That, that, that's the reason why we try plugging in the value of x first, just to see if we can. Because sometimes you can, and, and if that's the case, then, then you're there. You don't have to do any of this algebra tricks that we did on the other ones. Okay, <clears throat> so let's do a, one of these problems where you're finding values for, for constants that make a function continuous. So here we have a piecewise function. Um, part of it has this mysterious number A in it, and another part of it has this mysterious number B in it, and we're supposed to find values of A and B that make this function continuous the whole way through. So when you have a piecewise function and, and you have questions of continuity, you should be looking at the transition points. Like there, there's these certain values of x where the function transitions from one formula to the next. Like for x smaller than negative 1, well, le less than or equal to negative 1 more specifically, we use this formula. And then after negative 1, so, so for values of x that are just a little bit bigger than negative 1, suddenly we're using this formula instead. So I would describe negative 1 as a transition point. For, for values that are smaller than that, you use this. For values that are a little bit bigger than that, you use this. x equals 2 would be another transition point because for values of x that are just a little bit smaller than 2, you're using this formula, but then if you're a little bit bigger than 2, you're using that formula. So, I, uh, so, so we should phrase this in terms of limits. I'm going to look at the transition points. Uh, actually, let me... write down what I, what I just said. So, so the, the transition points are negative 1 and 2. 
For each one of those, I'm going to find the left-sided limit and the right-sided limit. And then I'm going to make sure that those are equal because I want this to be continuous. That means all these limits have to exist. That, In particular, that means the left limit has to equal the right limit for both of these. Um, so let's go through this. X goes to negative 1 from the left. That um, that means that x, we're imagining that x is uh, very close to negative 1, but smaller than negative 1, meaning I would use this formula because we're imagining that x is smaller than negative 1. So I just replaced f of x with a formula that's valid for the values of x that we're considering. And now that I did that, doing this limit is easy. X is going to negative 1, I, I can just plug it in. This is another example of why, we, why this is the first thing that we try when we're, when we're evaluating a limit. The first thing we try is just plugging in the value of X, and if, if that doesn't give us a problem, like dividing by 0 or anything, then we're done. So this limit is, is just 0. That should match... If this is going to be a continuous function, that's supposed to match the, the limit as x goes to negative 1 from the right. As x goes to negative 1 from the right, I have to imagine that x is very close to negative 1, but just a little bit bigger. So x would fall into this range. So I'm going to use this formula. Now I just try plugging in the value of x. Uh, x is negative 1, so this would be a positive 1, plus a. Um, so then, already I can figure out a, because the left-handed limit and the right-handed limit have to be the same. Um, So a would have to be negative 1. We still have to figure out b, but we, we got a. How do we figure out b? Well, we check the other transition point. So I did the limit as x goes to negative 1 from the left and also from the right. Now I'm going to do the limit as x goes to 2 from the left and also from the right. Okay, here we go. As x goes to 2 from the left, I imagine that x is just a little bit smaller than 2, so I would imagine that x is in this range. So I'm using this formula. Now I plug in 2, I get 4 plus a. Oh, and yeah, actually I already know a, so let me go ahead and just say that's 3. I, I could have put minus 1 here already, but whatever. Um, so that's 3. What's the other one? Well, for the other one, I imagine that x is a little bit bigger than 2, so I'm going to use this formula, bx minus 1. Now I plug in x equals 2, so I get 2b minus 1. And in order to be continuous, the left limit has, has to match the right limit, so this has to equal this. So 2b minus 1 equals 3, 2b equals 4, b equals 2. So that's it. That, that's, that's how you do one like this. You, you really just look at the transition points and make sure that the left limit and the right limit are the same. Um, okay, so let me do one last question for the test review. Um, <clears throat> so this is like out of 2.8, if you're wondering. Um, this is about the derivative as a function and what, what do graphs of derivatives look like. And remember that the derivative is supposed to be the slope of the tangent line for the original function. 
So what I have here is there's the graph of f of x, there's the graph of f prime of x, and the graph of f double prime, which is the second derivative. And of course, the second derivative is just the derivative of the derivative. And so I have the graphs of three functions here, but they're not necessarily in order. So it's not like this one's f of x, this one's f prime, and this one's f double prime. Uh, in fact, that's what we have to figure out. We have to figure out which is which. And so down here, the ant, like I have to say, you know, one of them is A, one of them is B, and one of them is C. So you can do one like this basically by process of elimination and just knowing basic properties of what is the relationship between the graph of a function and the graph of its derivative. Um, an important thing to look at is where are the functions increasing and where are they decreasing. Like this one, I would say as I move from left to right, I'm increasing. I'm, I'm going to the right and up. So in other words, as I, as I go through the graph sweeping from left to right, I'm going up at least until I hit this point. Uh, right about zero and then I'm decreasing because as I go from left to right from that point on I'm going down The derivative of this function Should take positive values wherever this is increasing and negative values wherever this is decreasing So Let me ask this question do I see one of the other two graphs that could be the derivative of this one. And, and what am I looking for here? Once again, since this is increasing up until about x equals zero, the derivative, if I see the derivative, would take positive values. In other words, it would the graph would be above the x-axis up until x equals zero. And do I see a graph like that? Well, this one is above the x-axis, but then it goes below the x-axis, and, and it's not supposed to do that, um, at, at least not, not for values of x that are smaller than 0, because once again, this one is increasing all the way up to x equals 0. Um, this one is above the x-axis all the way up to x equals 0. So then it looks like it looks plausible that c could be the derivative of a. And I'm not sure what that means yet. Like a could be the original function f, and then c could be f prime, or it could be that a is f prime and c is f double prime. But either way, it, it looks plausible that c would be the derivative of a. Um, <clears throat> now, we haven't talked about b yet. Well, we have a little bit, but just to determined that b couldn't be the derivative of a. Um, so now we want to ask ourselves the question, like, could one of these be the derivative of b? So let's take a look at the derivative of b. And, and again, what am I looking for here? I look at this graph and I talk about where is it increasing and where is it decreasing. I would say this is decreasing because as I go from left to right, I'm going down up until x equals negative 1. So this is decreasing up until x equals negative 1. And then it starts increasing from negative 1 to 1 and then decreasing again. So what would I look for if I was looking for the derivative of b? I would look for something that's any, wherever this is increasing, I look for its derivative to be above the x-axis. And wherever this is decreasing, I look for the derivative to be below the x-axis. In other words, I'm looking for a graph that is below the x-axis 
all the way up until x equals negative 1. And then it's above the x-axis from here to here. And then it's below the x-axis from here onward. That looks like that graph. Right? And not that one, but that one. So A... could be the derivative of b. Once again, and I'm, I know I'm repeating myself here, but wherever b is decreasing, this one is below the x-axis. Whenever this one is increasing, this one's above the x-axis. That, that's what we're looking for. So I would say this is enough information because this is really just sort of process of elimination and determining what's plausible. There, there's only going to be one possibility that, that's, that's plausible here. Um, I, I'm not going to try hard to, to really confuse you about the various relationships these could have. C could be the derivative of A and A could be the derivative of B. So then... B could be the original function f of x, and then A would be the derivative of that, so A would be f prime, and then C would be the derivative of A, and, and if A is f prime, then the derivative is f double prime. So what did I just say? B could be the original function, A could be the derivative of that, and C could be the derivative of that.